Hey everyone, welcome back to Better Biomed. Today I am in San Antonio. I took the trip over here because I wanted to visit one of my key sponsors, and that is College of Biomedical Equipment Technology. They've been one of the first entities to really support me and support this channel, and they have a lot more going on than what you guys realize. So, joining me today is the management team of the College of Biomedical Equipment Technology. Guys, if you can go ahead and introduce yourselves and explain your roles with the uh, college, please. Well, hi, Justin. I'm Bill Bassick. I'm the founder of the college. Before that, I worked in the uh, service industry and uh, had a need to hire biomed techs that needed specific training. And that was the reason for finding the college and, and creating it. It used to be a brick and mortar back in 2007, and then it was sold and we reacquired it back in 2017 as an online school. And from there we grew to what we are now, the College of Biomedical Equipment Technology. Okay, so how many years have you guys been around exactly? We've been around all together since 2007. My math fails me, so you have to do the calculations okay. on that. Wow, that's longer than I thought. All right, sir? Yeah, uh, Monty Gonzalez. I'm the uh, president of the College of Biomedical Equipment Technology. Uh, my role at the school is really um, focused on building strong strategic partnerships and business relationships with our industry friends and uh, working on strategic issues inside the school and working with my colleagues here, including Mr. John Schmidt. Hi, I'm John Schmidt. My current position is the Director of Programs and Innovative Solutions. What I do is I reinforce those partnerships by creating programs of education in order to better facilitate the partnerships we have with inside of this industry. Okay, excellent. So. These here are the three guys that know everything that's going on with this college, along with the future. So we're going to go ahead and get right into it. First off, guys, I, I would really like to know, you, you kind of mentioned a little bit about how you got started, but if you think about it, an online college for biomed, uh, as far as I know, it hadn't been done before, not, not like this. Why, why did you get into it? And you know, how exactly has it been going since you started? I had an idea a while back to take a brick and mortar bring it online because speaking to people throughout the country that didn't uh, live near a city or didn't live near a biomedical school, wanted to get into the program and didn't have the means of doing it. So I just had a vision a while back and said, let's just go ahead and run with this. And we did, I mean, it had its ups and downs when we first started, it had uh, a lot of criticism, which that's fine because if everyone shared the same vision, we'd have too much competition. So uh, with that being said, we just took a chance and believed in our vision and I have an excellent team that supports us. So right now, about 80 to 90% of the population is actually removed from the vicinity of any major biomed equipment technology program. And it's, it's, if you look at the map, it's very sectional. We get the West Coast, we get some on the East Coast. Texas, hey, yeah. Texas, we're one of the leaders in HTM. And I'm just curious because a majority of the Americans are removed from that, that puzzle. They don't have the option going into a local college. So you guys developed this online college program and it's, it's really interesting because it gives a lot of opportunity to a lot of different people that normally wouldn't have it. So what have you guys seen about your student base, where they come from, and uh, you know, what have they said so far about your program? So our student base is extremely diverse. Right. And it's not yeah. just a Texas, California, East Coast, West Coast. It, it's you know all geographical regions throughout the entire world. We've had students in Israel, yeah, yeah. we've had Africa. students in Africa, from various right. different regional locations. Um, and, and what we've done is we've kind of looked at the demographics of what they need. Okay. What's the requirement through that region? Well, well they need them everywhere. Uh, a lot of people can't spell biomed because they don't know what it is. And once they find out what it is, they realize the importance and the commonality of it. And that's why they come to our school because they can get this lifelong training that leads to this career that'll last them for their entire life. Right? But then there's also the modalities of, of you know, there's extra stuff I gotta do. And, and we offer that as well. So our student base isn't really, it's not really about being Texas, East Coast or West Coast. It's more about servicing an industry to okay. meet the needs of that industry. It's interesting you said that because, um, believe it or not, I've been written to by several of you guys as students who are uh, overseas. Mm -hmm. I, it really kind of surprised me that you guys have that kind of reach, but you most certainly do and it's growing and that's pretty impressive. Now, uh, the CBAT programs are designed for people of multiple backgrounds to be able to get into biomed or if you're in biomed, that you can uh, still continue your education. So if, if people, let's say they have a degree already, or maybe they don't have a degree, but let's say they have a degree and they want to get into clinical engineering or biomed, uh, do you guys have 
programs that can support that. So what are you, what are the different levels of programs that CBET currently has? Most people by this point are pretty familiar with our programs. Um, our, our center wheelhouse has always been built around the biomed certificate and degree programs. Um, we put a large number of students through that, those programs over the last couple of years and have really sort of set our goal as being really walk forward with no light between us and the industry we serve. Um, in doing so, we've, we've developed a really nuanced understanding what those career paths look like okay. and what technicians require after graduation, two, three, five, ten years into their careers, which have led us into some other areas that we didn't really understand or see five years ago. Right, including things like partnering with our colleagues at Charter College to develop a four-year HTM degree program. Okay. Uh, that la- launched two months ago. So you have a four-year program. So we have a four-year degree. Which is rare. That's, that, that's pretty rare in our industry. Rare. It's not a biomedical engineering program. It's a four-year HTM degree program, which okay. is focused on this career field, this career path, and the technical world that we live in. Um, we would have never walked into that sort of innovative thought and process and effort had it not been, again, really strong industry partnerships and relationships, including with organizations, you know, the big ISOs out there and big healthcare mm-hmm. organizations out there. And it's the constant conversations and dialogue and understanding of the nuanced requirements to be able to conceive what that degree path even would look like. So um, in terms of next programs, continuing education, upskilling, and where we're going, it's really about understanding where the industry needs to take us, uh, where, where our education needs to follow industry. We, we, we do not want to provide cookie cutter solutions where we're saying, this is what biomed looks like, now you got to fit into that mold. Our approach is a more complex um, right. approach, which to the bane of John's existence, <laughs> because he's the one who has to uh, play whack-a-mole when we give him a good idea. Um, but it, it's understanding the industry and building education around those requirements rather than building requirements and having the industry say, okay, that's what I have to do. Because that's the way it's been done in the right. past. So we don't do that. Another another example of that is a uh, program initiative John's le- leading, which is developing a healthcare information systems management certificate and degree program. Okay. Another great example of industry saying, what's going on in the technology space, cybersecurity, medical device integration, um, all of the technical components that are now increasingly a part of the medical device industry with everything networked. Uh, we recognize that the biomed of the future is not gonna look like the biomed of the 1990s. Right. So programs that we develop need to look like programs that a biomed 10 years from now is gonna need. Um, so the, those sorts of innovations and, and um, um, growth in terms of maturity of our organization, 100% contingent on our strong relationships with industry, and that's what helps us develop programs designed for upskilling. So you graduated, got your associate degree two years ago. What's next? So okay. let's say you have your associate's degree in biomedical equipment. Technology. So first off, you guys, uh, what what are the level of degrees that you guys currently have? Because I know you're expanding your line. Uh, so you talked about a four year degree. Um, that's a new development. So. You guys also have a certificate program, right? We have a certificate program, okay. which is a 24 credit out. Our biomedical certificate program is a 24 credit program, okay. which leads directly to your associate degree. 100% of those credits earned in the certificate then translate into the degree program should you choose to pursue that one following your certificate. Um, similarly, with the HISM concept that John's leading, that development, you'll have a 30 credit hour certificate program, slightly more robust, um, followed by a 60 credit hour degree program. So, you know, by by summer, I'm predicting, we'll have a, you know, a biomed path and a um, HISM path. Okay. Um, similar in some ways, they have some core features about them that are the same, but also different. And so, the way I have approached this and looked at it and strike I from that conversation, but the, our, our thought on this is, if a student completed their biomed degree a couple years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, and they recognize that the industry is changing and now to do my job better and more efficiently and and upskill and prepare for what's next, perhaps the HISM certificate is the next logical step for me and that makes sense. 
because now I'm going to understand medical device <coughs> integration and project management. I'm going to understand networking and IT fundamentals. I'm going to understand cybersecurity threat issues and, and, and how to deal with that. And I'm going to understand regulation attached to those requirements. So you guys have multiple uh, certificate programs. You guys have a two-year associate's degree. You are developing a four-year degree. And then, uh, so now, you're talking about you have advanced education programs. And uh, I've been reading through you guys' offerings, and they're expanding pretty quickly. So we currently have uh, an imaging academy. Yep. Okay, so there's an imaging academy, which is a partnership, right? It is, and, and let me back up okay. one step as well. There's, so on the traditional educational career path, we actually now have an alignment all the way up to a graduate degree level. Okay. So really? um, you can complete either our um, BMET associate degree, or here very soon, our HISM associate degree. Okay. And we have a two plus two relationship with Charter College, which means 100% of anything you earned at College of Biomedical Equipment Technology is accepted by our partner college, Charter College. So your two years go into that program. You have a I think they also have an accelerated degree path model, so you can then obtain your bachelor's degree um, with another 15 to 18 months worth of work. Okay. Um, and then we have a plus two to get your graduate degree, should you continue past that, with Central Washington University, and we're working on a similar partnership and relationship uh, with a university from Ohio, which John will be very excited about since he's from Ohio. Um, so our our effort in all of this, Justin, really is to look at how we can partner with educational institutions that are like-minded. How can we partner with educational institutions that believe like we do that our program has to match the industry's needs? Um, and then selectively curating those academic pathways to align with technical career pathways so that somebody can continue their education throughout their career. And okay. it doesn't all have to be about CBAT. Like, we, we want to bring all the students here. Of course, we, we feel like what we're doing is gold standard level. But we also recognize that um, I was talking to your colleague, Marguerite, earlier, mm -hmm. and um, online is not right for everybody. So these right. partnerships exactly. are really important and, and supporting students, different pathways, different like-minded uh, folks in the industry. It's critically important who you are. Um, so that's been our approach. So. A lot of people know that, you know, this is a technical career field. And with technical career fields, you can learn a lot of theory online. But when it comes to uh, the end of their tenure and when they're ready to graduate, is there some sort of externship? Like, what's, what's the path like for CBET? Because I know uh, biomeds, we learn a lot by OJT. And I know that you guys do some internships and stuff. So uh, how many hours are required for internship? Externship is what you guys call it, right? 136 hours. Yeah, and, oh, and okay. well, so COVID taught us some powerful lessons, right? Okay. Okay. Prior to COVID, the externship was a core component of our degree program. In order to complete the degree, you need to complete an externship. What COVID taught us is that the world around us is changing rapidly and we needed to change also. So where we used to have a formal externship as a required component of the degree program, that's no longer the case. Okay. Um, so a student now can still opt for an externship, and if a, if a provider is available to support that, we will gladly support that path. However, most of our students and most of the employers that we work with are not excited about an externship. They're ready to hire. Okay. You, you That's know, true. you know what true. demand there is in the industry right now, right? Yeah. So our goal has then shifted to align the curriculum exactly with what we know the employers need, okay. so that we hand that student off to the employer, ready to go to work. So they get in the door, and and you know, we we do OJT anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's what it comes down to. Okay. Yeah, and I always, I always use this as an analogy. No law school student that I know of graduated law school and went in and, and, uh, and started start practicing. practicing. Right. <laughs> there, there's training involved, and every organization is slightly different. The expectation should be that when you get a student from the College of Biomedical Equipment Technology, they have fundamental understanding of what the requirements are. They've participated in labs. They understand mm -hmm. basic medical equipment, integration requirements, and, and, and these things. Um, should be understood. But there should also be an expe expectation, as you pointed out, that, yeah, there is no JT requirement. It's a new student uh, in most cases, and, right. and I need to familiarize them not only with some fundamental requirements, 
but also maybe some organizational culture, some right. key communications, right. you know, those just nuanced items that an externship doesn't necessarily solve. So if you are an existing biomed and you're looking to continue your career, there's also paths for you. I mean, obviously there's the Imaging Academy, there's medical networking. Y'all, y'all uh, mentioned something about uh, medical networking earlier. Uh, what is the medical networking? Because I, I've mentioned on this channel many times before that the future is going to be like a clinical or medical networking specialist. It's a position that several entities, several notable hospitals have already established these positions. The VA medical system has already established this kind of position. It's happening, it's going to happen. We're going to assimilate, get closer to um, IT as we progress down this line because medical devices are going that way. So what, what do you guys offer for like, uh, you mentioned a HIMSS degree. So um, when it comes to uh, healthcare technology and medical networking, what do you guys offer when it comes to that? Because I, I know that you guys have some of, that, um, some of that coursework. So what is your medical networking requirements or what degree pass do you have? What led us down this path, and I want to really highlight and stop my foot on this one. Again, no light between us and the industry we serve is the goal. Okay. Two, two and a half years ago, we were contacted by our good friends and colleagues at Sodexo. Right. And uh, a gentleman named Chris Faulkner, if anybody knows Chris. And Chris, and uh, at the time his good friend Michael Angel, um, came to us and said, we want to do some upskilling and training in cybersecurity for our fleet of um, biomedical equipment technicians. We recognize that the industry is changing. There's software issues. There's all these things going on, right, that are exposing healthcare to cybersecurity threats and risks. From that, John and his team worked six to nine months with Sodexo, hand in hand, to develop a course um, that is broadly applicable, but specifically meets that need and to fill that gap. From that initial work with industry, John and his team conceived of an idea of let's let's take that to the next step. Now let's let's start to put structure around that and actually develop an academic program around that. So the genesis for that whole effort was not, hey, let's do market analysis and figure where the gaps are. The genesis for that development came 100% from our work with industry. Okay. And them telling us, this is what we need you guys to do. And then us bringing in Babe Ruth to step up to the plate and hit it out, and that's John. And what John doesn't often reveal is that he's got a really rich, deep background in this space, um, beginning with his work with the Pentium chip design team many years ago. Mm -hmm. So we feel we felt like we were prepared to address this issue, um, and I feel like where John has taken it is absolutely in the right direction. So that's my tee up for you, John, <laughs> that's my to, for to answer what network is. <laughs> so so to, to continue on with what Monty was talking about is we created this thing called the uh, EIIS program, which develops awareness. Uh, it's cyber awareness, but without the click this and get to the end of it and get a certificate. It's actually an education path. Yeah. Right, so it's a six-week class that starts at the beginning and works through so that you can have conversations with IT people. Because what we realized in this industry study is that, that there was a language barrier. There was a language barrier between the BMETs and the IT people. And then they couldn't talk to each other. One was speaking Spanish, one was speaking French, and the leadership was speaking Italian. Uh, nobody was having these conversations, so we learned that we needed to get this, this course to really be able to talk to each other. To say, hey, you know what, I know what an octet is. Hey, you know what, I know what a network port is. Okay. And understand the language so that they can have intelligent conversations with each other and reach that common ground, which of course is saving people's lives, right? providing a service inside of a hospital to save people's lives. That's the common ground of both IT, the leadership, and the, the biomed. So we said, hey, you know what, this is a great program that, that gets them talking, but how do we get them to product pro problem resolution? How do we get them to that end state of you know taking care of uh, patients? Well, we said, hey, there's a certificate program, and I call this a BMET Cyber. Okay. Right, a BMET Cyber, and I call it a BMET Cyber because I don't want to get away from our core values of BMET. Right? That's our core responsibility, is servicing that BMED industry and servicing that niche. So I don't want to step away from that, but I still want to make sure that we're doing the cyber stuff that we do right? and that we are now becoming responsible for. Right? There's this responsibility area. I worked as a network guy inside of a hospital. When someone called me and said they didn't, something wasn't working, I walked in and plugged something into the wall and said, you got network, and I left. <laughs> well, who's responsible after that? Well, that's the BMED. 
That's becoming the BMET's responsibility. Who's responsible for connecting it? And that's what this BMET cyber does. Okay. Is it creates that guy who's a BMET. He works on equipment, does his PMs. But then when they say, hey, you know what? This isn't connecting or this isn't doing it. He's the guy they say, hey, I, go to Randy. He knows that. He, he went to that course. He knows that stuff. Right? He's that guy. And then when he's done with that, he goes back to being a BMET. Okay. Yeah. I'd like right. to add to that, too. Sure. In the industry right now, there's a, a, there's a shift that's going on. You have um, the biomed departments that report to the facilities. And then you have biomed departments that report to the um, the IT departments. IT, right. mm -hmm. So when that shift goes, now they have to work together. And we know that in the next five years, you're not going to be carrying too much a toolbox to the shop anymore. You'll be call, you have to know how to software. You have to know how to network right. and do that. And you'll be using less and less tools as our technology evolves. Well, that's an interesting point. Now, this is going to be a little bit off topic, but i, I got to ask you guys because y'all are pretty knowledgeable when it comes to the trends of the industry. It's a widely debated fact that, you know, we are migrating closer to IT and yet there's a lot of people in the biomed realm that are hesitant or they're combative about us transitioning or becoming closer to IT. At this point, is it even something that we should be debating? So what, what do you guys, since you are the educators, what do you guys think about our, our move as an industry towards IT? I'll speak from an employer from a service side as well, is if our technicians are not willing to grow or learn, eventually we don't have a position for them anymore because it's going to require them to know, know how to network, know how to do the software that's required, know how to communicate effectively on the IT side, as John was mentioning. And without that, if they, if they refuse to do that, then it ties our hands, and as we hire more people, or as we grow, then they pretty much talk themselves out of a job, to be blunt. That's very true. And you know, this is something that I've been telling people for a long time, especially the junior level biomeds that are coming in, they're trying to find a niche, they're trying to get ahead, and I've, I've long stood and tried to tell them that, hey, guys, you need to uh, first get your certifications. Now you guys actually have uh, certificates and stuff that actually walk them down this road. I was always lecturing people to do independent study because that's traditionally how we've had to do it. But you guys already have done the work, you've created certificates, so it already future proofs people's careers. One more thing to think about, you know, we talk all the time about the silver tsunami, and I really like that term, you okay. know, an aging workforce. Oh yes. I can imagine some of the reluctance to embrace technology has to do with the fact that the workforce is aging. and. You know, let's face it, at 55 to 60, how much more do you want to learn or grow? You know, there are, there, there are, 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 there there is a, there is a reluctance by many to, to look at what's next because they know they're retiring in a year, two years, three years down the line. And, and I, and I kind of get that, but there is a, um, technological tsunami that is also occurring that we have to address. And so as we look at this workforce um, diminishing in the next few years and changing, that, that shift is gonna be, it's just gonna happen. Whether right. they embrace this or not, that technological tsunami that's moving in parallel and perhaps even faster than the silver tsunami is gonna be a reality. So I believe that we have gone from sort of an evolution to a revolution in change, and it is upon us today. So John and his team are working as fast as they can to address this just huge shift in, in what, the, what the technical requirements of a biomed will be here very soon. The Healthcare Information <laughs> Systems Management Certificate addresses that, what Molly was talking about, the, the evolution. Okay. Right, that's the evolution. It, it's gonna evolve that way. You have to embrace change. I, I've had to embrace change my entire life. Right? Especially people my age, we've gone a long way from the 70s to today. Right? A lot of evolution has happened. Right? Yeah. My car now talks to my house. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's very right? true. So there's a lot of evolution there. But we're at that point where now, when we hit that revolution, as Monty spoke about, that's when you're going to need your cyber bi biomed. Mm -hmm. right? Not just your biomed cyber, but your cyber biomed, where his focus is going to be integrating medical devices into things like the healthcare internet of things. How okay. am I going to protect and secure that from ransomware, which, by the way, is the number two target right now? Yeah. <clears throat> How do I protect those medical devices in order to protect those patients? Right? It becomes, yes, 
I'm a biomed, but I'm a cyber biomed. Mm -hmm. I, I have my associates in cyber specializing in biomed, like I said, our core. Right. Right? Specializing in that core of biomed. So I understand the biomed devices. I understand how they connect. I understand how they're used. I understand the utilization of them. Also the life cycle. I understand all the logistics involved and I also understand sharing it. So that's the revolution guy. He's the associate. Right? He's that associate's degree in cyber with a okay. specialization in BMET. Anyway, guys, I, I wanted to segue and uh, kind of change the pace a little bit. I want to talk about the SkillBridge program because it's, it's one of those programs that a lot of people don't understand. And a lot of the viewers of this channel are military professionals or they're people that are guard, reserve, and part-time military professionals. And I want people to know that there are options. And if you are currently a military member looking to come out of the military, or if you are a... Um, what else would be SkillBridge? No, please, uh, we have an expert here. Why, why am I even gonna try and answer this? Let's, let's tell everybody, what is SkillBridge? And, and what are the qualifications for SkillBridge? I mean, it's an amazing opportunity. This is coming from somebody who was medically separated from the military, and it was very traumatic for my family. And we didn't have options. So when I learned about this, I was 120% on board. And uh, to answer this question, Mani is, is one of the industry's experts for SkillBridge, so please. We discovered SkillBridge about five years ago, and we are a majority veteran-owned and operated organization. 75% um, of our workforce are veterans. Um, probably the majority of the rest are family members of veterans, um, and we're 100% patriot. I always like to put that out there. Yeah, so true. <laughs> a concept like SkillBridge was fantastic for us. We gravitated towards that like magnets. Um, and what SkillBridge does is it allows service, active duty service members during the last uh, 180 days of their active duty military obligation to break away from their daily duties as a service member um, to engage and work with an industry partner who's willing to invest some time into them in an OJT experience and environment. On that, uh, I just have to intervene a little bit, which means you can also uh, go outside of your core career path. So that's the beauty of this program is if, as a biomed, this isn't just for biomeds, right? So like other people, um, I've heard of people that are security forces, uh, people that are in avionics. So this is a multifaceted uh, solution for all sorts of career paths. The phrase I like to use with everyone that I talk to about SkillBridge is an Ellis Island approach that if you're going to engage in SkillBridge, you need to open your arms wide to all active duty service members and tell them if you're interested in, in working in the HTM industry, we're here to provide you a chance to prove yourself. What we have found is that regardless of the service member's prior experience, with the right amount of um, mentorship, guidance, education, and training, they can prove themselves successful. Um, to test that, about a year and a half ago, we, we opened our doors at an institution here and said, let's, let's bring three SkillBridge students in ourselves. Let's test it. Let's put our money where our mouths are and see how it works. So we brought in three SkillBridge candidates, um, various backgrounds. One of them was an avionics technician. Okay. One of them was a human resources guy. <laughs> um, I, I can't remember the other. The other guy was a, a, a helicopter crew chief. Okay. okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so three diverse backgrounds, right? One more technical, one more operational, one completely administrative. So it's a great test bed. All three of them did tremendously well with us. Uh, we ended up hiring one and kept him here. Uh, interestingly enough, he sort of gravitated towards marketing and, and VR technology development and those things on the curriculum side. One of them was prepared for employment in the industry and was hired by our good friends at AUS up in Oklahoma. Okay. So he was hired as an imaging technician. Wow, he's already got the golden goose egg. Already got the golden goose egg. Right. And the third one said, you know what? I love education so much. I think I'm going to continue it and, into my, and pursue a four-year degree. So he went yes. on to UTSA and now he's pursuing a four-year degree with UTSA. So 100% success. Again, Ellis Island approach. Don't look at SkillBridge as... I have to hire this person. Look at it as I have an opportunity to prove who our company is to this wonderful military veteran who's looking for an opportunity and a new career path. 
and convince them that you're the company that they need to go work for. And let that service member take that six months to prove to you that they're indispensable and you need to hire them and here's why. And it's not about the technical skills always, although those help. More often than not, it's about organizational culture, the characteristics of that person, you know, as we were talking earlier, communication skills, um, written skills, oral communication, you know, it, it's all of it. And, and, when you, and when you take that approach, you can be very successful. And I can tell you, we work with, again, a large number of industry representatives. Some of them are doing this exceptionally well and working with us in a really unique way. Um, others, I've seen them get the football and fumble it. Right. Now, if, if somebody wants to be a, a SkillBridge partner, I mean, there is multiple ways that you can do it. One way involves a lot of paperwork. You have to create a lesson plan. It's, it's actually quite the process. I did it for my company. Still not done with the process because it, it's very complicated. But there's a solution. If you guys are interested in becoming a partner, you guys are already a, a, like a SkillBridge distributor, right? I, I mean, it's how, how would you classify your relationship with SkillBridge and other industry partners who want to be part of this program? I will proudly state that we are one of the longest, um, uh, one of the most tenured SkillBridge partners with DOD. Um, our SkillBridge partnership began, I want to say five years ago, right after inception of the program. We jumped in there and said we need to do that. Again, for the reason I stated earlier, just because it felt like the right thing to do. Right. And it has since proved to be the right thing to do. So the fastest way to get engaged in SkillBridge is to call us <laughs> okay. and say, we would like to work with you guys in the SkillBridge program. Um, there is no paperwork required. Typically what we will do is establish a memorandum of agreement or memorandum of understanding and mm -hmm. say, yeah, we agree to work together and here's what SkillBridge requires. There's no financial transactions. Right. It is truly an Ellis Island approach. Right. An industry partner telling us we will accept military service members to provide them an OJT opportunity for a period of between 90 days and 180 days, at the end of which we have an ability and an option to hire that veteran if it's a good fit and makes sense. Right. Um, so my advice, let us let us work with you. Let us be the let us be the the good broker and continue to do the work that we do on the SkillBridge side. What's interesting about it is it can be complex because every service branch has a unique set of skill bridge requirements, a different set of regulations. Um, understanding those and then working with the uh, installation commands and the local command levels for approval requires a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do it and you want to you want to go through the filing process and, and do that yourself, you can. But I'm just telling you there's an easier way to do it. We already did all the legwork. Yeah, right, we're, right. we're happy to be that so, person. It costs nothing. Um, and we, we, our, our goal is to put great service members to work in the HDM industry because we know, we know what they can deliver. Um, and it's been proven time and time again, and we've had an incredibly successful track record with getting those service members placed. You can see he's very passionate about school. Oh, I am too, <laughs> because I mean, as, as I already said, I myself was a transitioning member um, because my lung collapsed twice, and that was the end of my military career. And I had to find a job, I had to move my family across the country, and I had to do that all without the luxury. So one of the hugest bonuses to this is it does, if you guys want to be an industry partner, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, and in doing so, it doesn't cost you wages, it doesn't cost you health care, because the member is still going to carry on their existing wages and their existing health care plan from the military. So it For you up to are six months. Yeah, up to six months, which is crazy. And what an opportunity. Could you imagine having a trial period where you can test out an employee for six months and see how they can grow, see their disposition? I mean, first off, I mean, my luck with military members has been really good. So I already like I give them uh, a leg of credibility that, you know, some people you wouldn't have because they already have leadership skills usually. They usually have uh, technical skills and a, a lot of them already have degrees. That's the thing that a lot of people don't understand. So SkillBridge is an excellent program. I'll leave information in the description below that you guys can check that out. But first I want, I want to address the elephant in the room. One of the things that CBET is known for, which we haven't talked about yet because it's such a weighty topic and there, there's so many advancements. I'm talking about the VR development. 
So VR is one of the things that CBET has really made a splash with, and they're leading the entire industry when it comes to VR and independent training. So guys, uh, your journey with VR has been amazing, and I wanna talk about what you guys have been able to accomplish and why why did you come up with VR in the first place? Let's let's talk about that. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny. I remember our first Amy that we went to. I took Monty to Cleveland, and we were over there, and we were trying to get into the educational meeting. So we had to get permission because we forgot to sign up for it. And fortunately, uh, Danielle extended that to us, and we were able to go in there. Well, at that time, I was Monty had another meeting set up, and we were exposed to the, the VR. I remember that she put the headset on me, I forgot the lady's name that was teaching it, and all of a sudden I'm in this room where there's an, anatomi an anatomical man and I said, all right, take out the heart, you know, just, and you're taking it out and there's an instructor standing next to you. And I said, well, this is really cool. Then they said, well, try this. Um, they had a CPR VR headset that I put on and I started doing CPR and there was an instructor in that room saying, you're pushing too hard, don't push that hard, you can break the rib. <laughs> And I'm thinking, this, this is amazing. If we could do this for medical devices, that would actually take care of the online problem of the hands-on training. So as soon as I got out of that course, I told Monty, he goes, how did the meeting go? I said, it went really well. Uh, we got to get into VR. You know, he's like, well, how do we do that? I said, we'll figure it out. And we just started working with it. And luckily, we have a very good talent team downstairs, and we share our vision with them. And they made it happen for us. Now, I myself, I've, I've tried out the VR. If you guys have ever been to any of the Biomed shows, probably in the last several years, they always have a really unique setup where you can try on the VR and you guys have multiple modules. Now, when it started out, I think there was one module and it was the one on uh, auto injectors. Yeah. And I, I've never torn open an auto injector, but I went through the module and I did it step by step. I can remember the ribbon cables and everything. Like, and I've never opened one. I'm 20 year biomed, I've never opened one. I guarantee I could probably do one right now. And yeah. I've never, I've never to this day, I've never seen one in person. Oh. That's the really interesting thing about VR. Um, it's easy to dismiss and look past how powerful those learning engagements can actually be inside of VR. And there's just a ton of research that demonstrates that um, learning outcomes meet and oftentimes exceed traditional training when you're utilizing VR, uh, because it does a couple of things for us. First off, and probably the piece I'm most excited about, is that it really sort of obliterates that 19th century educational model, right? Where class lasts for eight weeks on my semester. I start here, it ends here, and then when class is done, all I got left is a book. Well, newsflash, books are dead, okay? Books are not <laughs> alive. They don't change. They don't. They don't move forward at the speed of technology. If I want to read about the Count of Mon Monte Cristo, I love my books. But if I'm focused on education and training and the direction this industry is going, books no good to me. Is of no use to me. I'm, I can reference and research at it, but it can't teach me anything. Mm -hmm. If I was to replace books with VR that I could continuously engage in and go back to that's structured, that could be updated periodically, right. you've just completely disrupted the way we do education and training, and that's what we believe to be true. Right. So, to your point, the, the MedRat injector training that we demoed at the last AME exchange, fantastic opportunity. We had a bunch of students from the uh, school up in Canada come down and they engaged in it as well, and, and demonstrate exactly what you just said. We tested them on the VR, they went through it. Many of them had never seen that before, and then we put them in a in a real classroom space space with Steve Mall, yeah, yeah, and had Steve Steve kind of proctor and guide the process. All of them were successful in conducting a PM in under the prescribed amount of time on a live device after only obtaining that one opportunity to go through the VR train. That's very cool. It was it's amazing. So the the thing about VR is it's it's a tactile experience, and usually you know we are people we work with our hands. And usually people that work with their hands, they learn best by doing. That's why OJT is such an important and powerful piece of our uh, advancement. But this isn't just a gimmick. Once you, once you actually see it, uh, you'll see that it's, it's a real thing. But we're talking retraining. So um, let's say I haven't touched a device in six months. Right. You can pop it on, you can do a module in what, 15, 20 minutes? Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden now you have instant familiarity with something. So if I have a work order on something that I've never seen or I haven't seen in months, I can pop it back on, retrain myself really quickly. Um, 
You can also do continuity. So let's say, because it's all on the headset, right? Yes. So since it's on the headset, let's say I train this person on it and that person leaves my hospital or my company. Well, you can take the headset and give it to the next person and you can have them complete certain modules and now they're trained for continuity reasons. But it, it's also for uh, longevity because you guys are still developing new modules and you're, you're in a constant state of production. So currently, what do you guys offer? I know you guys have some stuff that you haven't released yet, but currently, how many modules do you have? And I also know that you guys have some partnerships. So if you guys want to elaborate on some of that, about some of the, some of the new roads that you're taking with this VR venture. Let me not talk about the specific modules yet, okay. because our, our full content library is under development now. Um, we anticipate that the full content library will be ready to launch by June or July Okay. Um, with a sort of a phase one launch. And it's fairly robust. I would say probably 20 different medical devices plus test equipment. Um, so in terms of content and library, that's generally what you can expect to see come June or July. Okay. Um, to include things like MedRat injector and you know injector training. I think we're working on a content right now for the Stellant. Okay, there are different, different devices and varieties. Um, but in terms of partnerships, you asked about that. Yeah. You know, probably, um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier we're working with Probo Biomedical on a, um, a concept around ultrasound. Uh, we're working on some early stage discussions with um, AUS on ultrasound as well. Um, we're working very, um, very closely with 626 on a much broader imaging suite of training modules. And is that also Imaging Academy? Because I, 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 I think Academy. I remember something about yeah. 626 and Imaging Academy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that that has been underway. Um, and then probably the one that's most interesting is the work that we're doing with St. Pete's College down in Tampa, Florida. Um, with, with that work, they, they, uh, they were the recipient of a grant from the state of Florida uh, to approach opportunities with high school STEM programs. They came to us and, and asked us to um, consider participating in this grant opportunity and submit a proposal, uh, which we did, uh, which was accepted, fortunately. And so now we're about two-thirds of the way through the development of a project with St. Pete's College. And, and the end result of that will be a content library that's going to be distributed throughout the state of Florida uh, to STEM high school programs to encourage students at the high school level to go into biomedical um, uh, equipment repair technician roles, jobs, or biomedical engineering, but really get students oriented towards this career field and this academic pathway. Um, so those are probably some of the most exciting opportunities we have in front of us. Um, uh, we're also working with some companies out in California. Um, just a number of different really interesting opportunities and partners. Future development, so. Future development, Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know that you guys are also working on some leadership courses. I know you might not be ready to talk about it, but we, we mentioned earlier that there's programs for people who are currently already biomeds. You're always looking for that next level. How do you compete against your peers? I know you guys are working on something like that well, that you might not be ready to talk about, but I know it's happening. No, we are in a, in, in a little bit. We could talk about it, but what I wanted to bring up earlier was John was speaking on the IT and how that the biomed needs to understand networking and IT. but. Our industry also demands that we understand our business, not just to be a blue-collar biomed, but to be a professional. And in doing so, we have to understand our HTM shop as a business owner. So these leadership classes are designed not only to have effective managers, but to understand it as an effective leader and as an owner in the biomedical industry. Okay. So that's the reason that uh, we decided to develop that. So we have um, Al Gresh, who wrote the Amy book, um, he's uh, spearheading, yeah. He's spearheading uh, the development of this course or courses. There's going to be eight or nine courses. I can't remember how many. He's still deciding, and they're going to be one to two week courses each. Okay. And I believe, uh, what did you decide to name it? Well, I mean. we're, yeah, it's early days in development, Justin. Okay. Um, but <laughs> again, like everything else we're doing here, it's driven by industry's yeah. demand. Um, and it's not us going out and conducting these big, broad national surveys saying, you know, is this right? It's them. It's our, it's our partners with whom we've formed relationships of trust coming back to us and saying, are you guys doing this? If not, can you? And our response to that is, let's get the very best subject matter experts we can. 
We don't know it all. We think we do, right? But we don't. So let's get the best subject matter experts, in this case, Al. Okay, Al's a great guy with a fantastic reputation and a heart of gold. And saying, Al, let's, let's design a series of leadership seminars that are specifically targeting leadership issues in HTM. And, and so we're probably two-thirds of the way through the development on that. Um, as an accredited institution, we have some decisions to make. You know, do mm -hmm. we want to formally accredit those and get those as, as you know, accredited, accredited programs? Do we want to just deliver them in a B2B model? Um, some interesting opportunities. One of, the, one of the more interesting ones is I go back to our good friends at Amy. Um, fantastic relationship with uh, um, Amy as an organization and the work that they do and are huge, huge endorsers of the work they do. Um, and we're exploring collaborating with them on the delivery of these courses, something we're excited about. So we don't know what the end result will be early days, uh, but the genesis is again industry saying, what are you guys doing? Can you do this? Do you want to do this with us? And really work on it in a collaborative way, not a, here's what right looks like. Interesting. Well, the fact that the industry is leading you guys uh, down the path, uh, I, I say that speaks volumes for where CBET is headed. The industry also, the, right now they currently look at you guys like leaders in the industry. And that's why they're reaching out to you, which is Really why I was excited when CBET said that they would be interested in sponsoring me. Uh, guys, I would like to thank you all for your time. Uh, we're gonna do a, a whole series of videos. I know you guys are gonna have a lot of questions. We're gonna, we're gonna get you specifics. There's a lot of content here, guys. If, what you guys think they handle versus what they actually handle. And uh, is there any other future plans that you guys well, are interested in talking about? Be, yeah. Our chop classes, oh, our compliance chop. classes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I'll let, let me set yeah, that up. Yeah, so three. So when anyone asks us what we do internally, I always tell everybody, I look forward. Our other bu business colleague, Scott, is looking internal. John is managing whack-a-mole. <laughs> um, and Matt's managing the technical stuff. And Bill's always looking skyward, okay? Bill's looking for the unicorns mm -hmm. in the room. That's his role as chief strategy officer. He's got the most experience in the industry in our group and is looking for those opportunities. One of them that he saw a few years ago was an opportunity to look at how we can further expand our core competencies around accreditation and compliance in healthcare. Okay. And through a couple of relationships that Bill formed, we were able to form a partnership with DNV. Okay. Um, That's a regulatory agency, guys, if, if you don't know. The, you know, we have joint commission. We're going to do a whole video on regulatory <laughs> because it, it is an entire college class in itself. But it's, it's absolutely essential that you guys understand. So when we're talking about CHOP, that is a level, it's a certification that you yeah. can achieve, right? Yeah, it's a permanent certification you have on. You need 40 uh, CEUs every two years to obtain it. Okay. And then if you, you have the CHOP-B, which is the basic, the CHOP-A, which is the advanced, and they just came out with the CHOP-E, which is the administrative. It's more on the management level on, on compliance. So it covers construction, finances, budgeting. Okay. Well, guys, we're, we're gonna, we're, we need to cover that in detail. It's something that I've been meaning to cover for years is regulatory, uh, regulatory. And, um, you know, DNV, they're actually gaining a lot of uh, market value. Um, I don't. I don't really want to call it market, but you have to consider it that right. Well, yeah, they're because the number two inspecting organization right now right. behind the Joint Commission, but they're gaining probably five to ten hospitals every two months. Right, and, and some of them are very prominent. Like yes. my first experience with uh, DNB was Houston Methodist, yeah. which is probably one of the most prominent uh, heart hospitals in the nation, and they use DNB to which. I think actually is a better program. We'll, we'll cover that in detail. And it's a really fun class. So, yeah? Yeah. I, I know, I, normally when you talk about that stuff, it, it, it's very elaborate, which is why this course is gonna be essential because you could take the certification alone, reading the book, but you guys have already digested the material and you found a structured approach. Once. Yeah, I know. And, and if, uh, yeah, and, uh, so uh, let, me, let me address that a little bit more too. And I know we're gonna go into a lot more, but I'll just say, why is the chop class important to a technician, right? I go to work, I gotta handle my medical devices and do my work and fill in my, you know, take care of my job orders and record the information. Why do I need to, why do I need to take a CHOP class? What's the value in that? It's hugely important for any healthcare professional who's involved in accreditation or compliance and any part of that chain of responsibility. From the, from the foundational level, the technician out there doing the work, all the way up to the C-suite. 
And those CHOP courses are designed to address what you need to know as a technician in your role and how do you fit into accreditation and compliance in healthcare. And, and it helps technicians and managers and senior leaders understand not only holistically within the organization how accreditation and compliance works, but also on a very individual level, what my role is. What do I need to concern myself with in my current role? And if I'm a technician today, but I want to be a manager tomorrow, I need to know what I need to know as a manager today, right? And build into that. So back to your earlier question about upskilling and continuing education, right. CHOP fits nicely into that model and is an important part of that. Interesting. It helps you integrate with different departments as well. So if you don't just focus on your own department, you understand needs and compliance with eight other departments within the hospital itself. And uh, you know, the, the whole thing about the DMV is that you have to establish your own quality control program. And you know, the quality control is you know, departmental, you know, there's different levels for different areas. Um, we're definitely going to do a whole nother video on that, guys. But anyway, guys, I, I want to thank you guys all for uh, tuning in. I want to thank the guys from CBET for inviting me down here. We're going to plan out and we're, we're going to do a, a whole set of formal videos for you guys. And some of them are just going to be informative. We're going to break down uh, pretty sensitive topics like self-inspection and regulatory agencies. And we'll, we'll give you uh, a pretty good approach from industry experts and what this this content is so guys uh thank you all for joining me well, thank and you for, us. for explaining cbet who is an industry leader and you're going to see more from them if you are going to the amy show coming up soon uh why don't you guys stop by and see their demo of their vr and talk to them about their degree programs and their certificate programs that they currently have if you are active duty military you're looking for an option check out Skillbridge. check it out it's a very good program, and these guys are going to be the broker for the program for companies like mine. So, guys, thank you all for your time. I do thank appreciate you. it, and stay tuned for more videos from CBET.